like, well, what are your monthly events about? It's about your kids. It's about your future. Because you prosper, you do well, it impacts your family. Who's here for their family? Anybody? So Tina's going to show you how to thrive. She's going to you how to co- show you how to conquer. She's going to show you how to build an empire, how to become the CEO. And it starts with you. It's, don't look at anybody else's room. You are the CEO. And she's going to explain that concept to you and how to go to the next level. So help me welcome from Raleigh, North Carolina, my good friend, Tina Cole, everybody. Woo! Get on your feet. Come on, get on your feet. Let's hear it. down. So it is true that um, Brent had to beg me to come out here because usually when he calls to say, hey, can you speak at an event? It's usually like 15 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. And then I found out it was two hours. I'm like, no, I can't do that. I can't talk for two hours. But um, I have prepared some presentations today because I am a forever learner. So I, my favorite spot in rooms like this is literally in the back corner with a notebook, taking a lot of notes. I know I've seen Brent at events taking tons and tons of notes. So hopefully my, my goal today, um, and I wrote it down, is that you guys get three things out of this. Number one, is you learn more about self-leadership. CEO to me, anytime I see that, those three little letters, it makes me cringe because people go, oh, you're the CEO, you're the CEO. For me, um, CEO is chief experiment officer because for 24 years I've been experimenting in the business and I've had probably more failures than many in the room, which helps me win a little bit because I've just taken the chance. And I'm, I'm willing to just look stupid just to be on stage here today, you know, with all of you for two hours. So it's not going to be perfect, but my goal is that you guys walk away with tools. So the first tool that we're going to learn about is called the working genius. I'm a licensed facilitator now. I geek out over this stuff for the last two years. It has changed my life. Um, hopefully it will change yours. So we're going to look into that because you can't be the CEO of your life without leading yourself first, your emotional intelligence. The second thing is the power of your circle. How many people are uh, here with our company today? I know we're agnostic, but we've got a lot of family in the room. EXP, yay, and non-EXP. Wow, okay, we got some of you. You had enough guts to say woo. Um, (laughs) And then we're going to talk about vision, how to find your path through um, something that I kind of just created in my mind at 3 a.m. in the morning. I popped out of bed to help my team because usually whenever I come up with an idea, it's usually to help other people. Um, And so we're going to talk about that. So, oh, thank you. I get a little one of these. I got a lot of things to hold. Um, So let's move right into it. Um, I have been 24 years in the business. I started out as a solo agent. How many solos do we have here today? Yay. And so for for the first seven years, I didn't have a mentor. I had a a broker at our office, and he was actually our number one competition. Um, So he competed against the agents. So whenever we would ask him things, it it just didn't feel as good as it should have, knowing what I know today. So for the first seven years, I just let real estate happen to me. Does anyone feel like that happens in their day? You kind of wake up and you're like, whatever happens, happens. That was my first seven years. And I did not get great results. I sold 20, 25 homes a year, which was really, really good, but it wasn't scaling. And then 2006 hit, and by 2008, I was making $150,000 a year. It went down to $40,000. And I was like, this is not fun anymore. I'm not, I'm not making the money that I thought. I grew up in a pretty poor family. And so making $150,000, I thought I'd made it. And then I didn't. And so I thought, okay, this is really, really bad. I'm going to leave the business. And I started to pack my desk up. I was at that point where I was leaving the business. And I remember opening up... Um, one of my file cabinets, and I pulled out a sheet of paper as I was cleaning out the files, and it said, join us at the Mike Ferry Retreat. We'll teach you how to make $200,000 a year in real estate. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And down below it said, hire a coach for $2,000 a month. And I crumpled up that paper, and I threw it in the garbage because I'm like, I'm broke right now. I don't have two grand a month to give to uh, you know, a company. A couple of days later, I was still cleaning out my desk in my office, and I got an email, and it said, come to this retreat, and it was in Romulus, Michigan, which is only about 40 minutes from my house, and I thought, well, I prayed about it and prayed about it. Should I leave real estate? And maybe this is a sign, and it was the Mike Ferry organization again, 
And I thought, okay, I'm, I better go. So I packed up three of our agents in the office. We went out to Romulus. And I sat in a room about this big. And I sat in the back, my favorite spot. And there were a few people in the front row that got up. And one of them was Jeff Glover. Who knows Jeff Glover? A couple people, yep, yeah, from uh, KW. So he was young at the time, like me. And he stood up and he said, I made $250,000 this year. And I was like, how the hell did he do it? He was promoting that coaching company. And so I thought immediately, okay, if he can do it, I can do it. I need to hire a coach. So think about it. On the way home that day, I had to go home and tell my husband that I just signed up for a $1,000 a month coach. And I was going to learn how to sell real estate again. And he was pissed uh, because we did not have a lot of money. So anyway everything started to shift. And so what I learned was process. I learned repetition. I learned how to structure my day. And my income went from 40,000 to 150 that next year. And we got the guts to move out of Michigan because we were not a tree and we could do that. Um, and we, we moved to a place where the wind didn't hurt our face four months out of the year. And so... <laughs> We moved down to North Carolina that first year. I sold uh, 35 homes, then 55 homes, and 80 homes, and 100 homes with my new plan, which was get in the office every day, talk to people, talk to a lot of people, get rejected at a high level. The richest agents in this room are going to be the people that can take rejection at a really high level, and then do it over and over and over again. And then finally, by 2015, I said, I need more leverage. I'm not doing this right. My family was like falling apart because my husband was like, you're always on the phone. Who has a spouse that says, you're always on the phone. You never pay attention to the kids. You never are here. You're never present. I know I'm doing this for us. Who said that to their spouse? This is my job. I have to be on the phone. And so think about it. We're all at the beach, but your family's down playing at the beach, and you're negotiating a deal. It's just what we do. But I realized at that time that I had to do something different. And so I hired my first buyer's agent, Laura, who's still with me today, 11 years later, and I gave her all the buyers, and I kept the listings. And so... I'm a really good listing agent. That is what I'm really good at. You know, like I'm not a speaker, you know, I'm not a coach of any sort, but I am a really great listing agent. That's my superpower. So as I started to build the team, I thought, oh my God, this is leverage. I get to watch Laura make a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. I did that for her. She did the work, but I gave her a path, and then I got to do it again and again. And Ashley, one of my agents here in the room today, you know, we'll talk about her a little later too. The gift of giving back your knowledge, it just gets me high. It's so exciting. So that's what I want to give to you guys today because I have made some steps towards some solutions, and they may not be for you, but they just might. So let's get into the first one. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work right. All right, so if you're thinking about starting a team, which some of you in this room should be thinking about that, if you're at 50, 60, 70 deals a year, you're going to need leverage eventually. And real estate's the only business that we get our license and we stay doing it solo for a really long time like a badge of honor. And I think we can do it better because when Brent says, I sold 1,000 homes, he's lying. <laughs> I didn't sell one home last year. Not one. That team did. Those humans did. We made $10 million on our team. $4.5 million went to them. You know, we kept a million too, but I'm just saying it all went to them. And so when you think about that, I didn't sell one home this year or last year or the year before. There is leverage there. There is freedom. I get to fly out here and be with you guys today, and the team is back home. Again, leverage. So these are the books I would get. Um, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team, because when you start working with people, my husband always says, people ruin everything. <laughs> because think about it, all of you in this room, grew up in a tribe where you learn certain things, certain beliefs, certain habits. That's your tribe, your parents, your grandparents, whoever raised you taught you what to believe. And now we're all sitting in a room, and I'm going to show you what I believe, and then you guys get to decide, do you believe it or not? And some of you are going to go, well, I don't believe it. She's full of crap. And others are going to go, yeah, I believe it. I'm going to try that. It, we just have to learn how to function with other people. So we had a lot of dysfunction on our team. I have a different leadership team that I do today than I started with because I hired friends and family and people that I like that were just like me. And that is not what we do. We hire people opposite of us that can bring up our weaknesses. So five dysfunctions of a team, five levels of leadership by John Maxwell. Who loves John Maxwell? Love me some John Maxwell. Um, so he talks about like that we all have that leadership ability in us, but we have to learn it. Like where in real estate school did we learn leadership? 
interpersonal management skills, emotional intelligence. We do, they just hand us a license and make us go sell homes. So we don't learn these things. And last but not least, the six types of working genius, which did change my team. My operations manager, Terry, brought this to me one day and she said, read this book, it's gonna change our organization. And I read it in one night and I, it changed our organization. And what I woke up realizing is that I knew a lot about myself, but I didn't know a lot about others. And as I started to really realize what they needed in their lives, they were all in the wrong seats, they were doing the wrong jobs, and it was a big hot mess. So that got us to um, study it a little bit more. So why does working genius matter? It matters because everybody, regardless of their genius, craves to be seen, understood, and wanted. That's what all of you want. Right? You don't want to get rejected. You want to be loved. You want to be seen. You want to, you want to know that your opinion matters, and it does. Like The biggest thrill that I would get is sitting in a room like this and just listening to all of your stories and hearing your feedback on this event today. Like I, just, that I would eat that up because it matters. And so when you understand your people, it creates an environment of success. So if you're leading anybody, even your household, someone's got to lead the kids, you've got to figure out what are your kids like because guess what? They're not you. Like everyone gives me credit because my son is such a nice boy and he's such a good conversationalist. I didn't do that because I know that my husband grew up in a family with three boys with the most perfect parents and all three of them are wildly different. So why are they different? They can't take credit for the good. You can't take credit for the good if you don't take credit for the bad. So this tool is to, is, is to be used to identify your individual unique strengths in areas of expertise and how you can leverage when working on a team. Now, when you think about teamwork, you usually you use teamwork everywhere. You use it, obviously, on your team and your work environment. You use it at church, you know, when you guys have to do stuff together. Your kids use it in school. We're constantly working with other people. So what this assessment does, which a lot of you can write down, theworkinggenius.com, that is where you can go take this assessment officially. But what I have discovered on a plane a few months ago is when we would do this for the audience, people got a little bit lost because they hadn't taken the test. And I was like, how can we figure out a way to do this in an audience where they don't have to pay the 20 bucks and we can get an 80 to 90% accuracy? So we figured it out and so that's what we're gonna do today. It talks about the stages of work. So in any sort of work, let's say today I said, hey, we're going to have a church bake sale. And all of you are in the congregation. I would tell you all that, okay, guys, we're going to have... We're going to have an ideation session. I think there's a pointer on this thing. There it is. Okay, so see how there's three little lines here? We've got ideation, activation, and implementation. And so what was happening on my team, I'm an ideator, so I have lots of ideas. And so I would start spitting out ideas, and then my galvanizer, who was my operations sales manager, so think of Brent Gove, he's the, t the best galvanizer ever, is he not? Yeah. Yes, yes, so what Brent does is galvanize. So I would have an idea, and my galvanizer uh, partner would take my idea and run with it. And then like a week later, I'd be like, why did we do that? She's like, you said. I'm like, yeah, but I, scratching my head, that's not how I envisioned it. I was just spitballing, I think in ideas. And so what we discovered is we were not following a process because work is a process and work is a six letter word. You need all six geniuses to, to complete a task. And I only have two geniuses and so do you that bring you joy and energy. Meaning if I assign you to this task that's within your genius and you're gonna go, yes, I'm so glad I get to do this today. So ideation would be the first thing. I would say, hey everybody, we're gonna have a bake sale. Let's ideate, what should we do at this bake sale? And all the people that have a lot of invention would start going, oh, we should do this, we should do this, we could have this. And then there's gonna be people in the room that go, I can't think of anything. Who are the I can't think of anything people? Like it's hard for you to think of ideas just on the fly. They're, you're in here and you're gonna realize why. So there are people that struggle with that. So first we have ideation, then we have activation. This is where the discerners will poke holes in all the ideas that we came up with, our wonder inventor people, and will be the Debbie Downers. They go, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. No, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. And you're like, why? Because this, 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 and this, and their famous line, just trust me, I know. It's not gonna work. <laughs> and I, the, all the discerners are laughing right now. So, and that's why your husbands and, you know, your wives hate you because you're always crushing their dreams. 
But if they were good ideas, you would let them do it. So anyway, then we've got our galvanizers. Once we've all ideated, we've discovered what is wrong with the idea, what is a good idea, then we bring it to the galvanizers, the Brent Goves of the world, and we go, Brent, we've got an idea, and here's what we're doing. And guess what he does? Rallies the troops. Is he not the best troop rallier? He pushes people, and he motivates people, and he gets them into action. He's like, guys, we're having a bake sale. It's going to be the best bake sale in the world, and everybody needs to be at this bake sale, and follow me. We're going to have lots of fun. And he's going to go recruit all of the enablement people, the people that just want to help for the sake of helping. They don't care what it's about. It sounds fun, but they're in. How can they help? They're so excited. This is the implementation phase. You got a lot of ETs. Our entire team was missing ETs. We had all WIs, like me. We had so many ideas, they all ended up in the idea cemetery. <laughs> Nobody to execute. Think about that. How many of you, you have ideas, but no one's executing them? Because these people down here get a thrill of execution. James Stroop, how many know James Stroop, Brent's partner? He is, an, he is a T. He has tenacity. He can, he can land that plane. Right? So he is going to take Brent's, you know, galvanizing. He's going to get these people into action. He's going to tell them what to do. And he's going to have a process. And he's going to land that plane. And we're going to have a, the least bumps and bruises. So this is implementation. When we skip these things, when we go from ideation to implementation, mistakes happen. Things do not get executed correctly. And we have really bad results. And so when, on our team, what we say every time we have meetings, we say, is this an ideation session? Is this an activation session? Or is this an implementation session? And we'll group the people that love to do all these things. Because if you're having an implementation meeting about how to set up the stage and, oh, you know, all the little details we have to do for the event, I am out. I don't want to be at that meeting. It's boring now. And get me back to the idea session. And that's where I want to live. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, so you can think of this in anything you do, planning a trip for your family. You know, okay, what's the idea? Hey, we all want to go to Europe. Where do we want to go? Do we want to go on a cruise? Do we want to go on an Airbnb? Do we want to stay at hotels? This is the time where we ideate. Then who is going to poke holes in these ideas, make sure that they're going to, you know, work? Who's going to get the family excited, mom or dad? And then who's going to actually plan the trip? and call the, the people that, you know, and book the flights and do all the tenacity stuff that a lot of us hate to do. So it works in life, too, and in business, right? Personal life. So let's grab a sheet of paper, which I think all of you have. Okay, great. What we're going to do on this sheet of paper, and this is how you're going to try to think about your working genius. I'm going to go through all six. And you're going to, I'm going to be looking for the hell yeah, that's me, or the hell no's, okay? So there's two geniuses. When I say the word and describe what it is, you're going to go, that is me, hell yeah, that's what I like to do. And there's going to be two that you go, I hate them. So on your paper, write widget, uh, top to bottom, hell yeah, widget, W-I-D-G-E-T, W-I-D-G-E-T. All in a, what is that, vertical, vertical, right? Not horizontal. So vertical. All right, so the first one, we're going to talk about our wonders. So I have a wonder in the room. It's Ashley who came with me. Wave Ashley to everybody. That's Ashley, our, our wonderer. So everything starts with wonder. Everything in life starts with somebody pondering life. I wonder why the sky is blue. I wonder why that mountain is over there, whatever. They have questions. So it's, oops, let's go back, 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 back. So this is a strong ability to question and ponder about any given situation. They find it easy to lose themselves in observing the world around them and wondering, should things be different and is there untapped potential? So anything, whenever they walk into a room, they might go, I wonder if this event could have been better. I wonder what the team is missing. I wonder if I could elevate that. They start really high up. If you think of an airplane in altitude, they are head in the clouds. These people can get lost in thoughts for two hours. And a lot of times you'll describe them as their head's always in the clouds. Like, come on down. Ashley is always exhausted she might be sitting in the chair, but unless you see steam coming out of her ears, you won't know she's working. But at the end of the day, she's exhausted because her brain is constantly going. Versus a James Stroop who's running around, planning things, and everyone's like, wow, he's so good. Look at all the work he's getting done. So a lot of ETs, they get all the credit on teams or in environments because they're always busy. They're always doing something. It's the WIs and the Ds that don't get that credit because their work is right here. Does that make sense? So these people, 
with this genius tend to think and say, I just don't think this is the way it should be. I'm not sure why, but I just know we're missing something. Are we asking the right questions? They, they tend to ask really good questions. They want to ponder things more. There could be something we're not thinking of, and it's hard for them to make a decision because there could be a different solution. So it's, they're really indecisive. They're genuinely curious about the other person. They ask a lot of questions, hard to land on decisions. So great roles for them is where questioning and reimagining the world is key. So they do make, like, I think, our, I think Glenn Sanford, I think he's a wonderer. I do. I think he wonders and ponders, and he came up with that crazy invention 10 years ago. So what they crave is consideration. My husband is a W, and he used to come to me and be like, I wonder why, you know, the people back in the day did this. And I'd go, who cares? And then he, all he wants is consideration for me to go, yeah, honey, that's interesting. I'm going to think about that more. <laughs> yep. They're crushed by being dismissed. So when you know that your spouse is a wanderer and you're like, I wonder what he's doing all day. Well, he's wondering too, so he's in his head. <laughs> so do not crush them. Do not say who cares. Because again, going back, everyone wants to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to feel valued. So if, you're, if your spouse or your child is a wanderer, we got to give them that value because there is value there. Everything starts with W. So if you're a heli app, circle the W. I, I forgot to say that. Or put a star by it because you're going to look for two stars and then you're going to look for two, like cross it out and exit out because you hate doing those things. All right, invention is next. So these people love to come up with new ideas or solutions to any problem. If you say the word problem, they get off on it. They're like, what's the problem? Let me solve it. They, they always seem to have ideas that come out of thin air all day long, even when they're not needed. So when I think back to, yeah, see all you inventors are laughing. When I think back to Kevin and I, we met at 15 and we've been together ever since I'm 46. And we would be driving in the car, and he would drive down these roads, and I'm like, I wonder why he's going that way. Like, we could go this way. And I'd say, honey, we could have turned left there and got there faster. He's like, who cares? Like, why, why would we do that? I'm inventing as we're going. I'm inventing a better way. Nobody asked me for my opinion and why we should be going this way. So I had to learn to keep my inventions to myself. So what we tend to think is, hey, I've got an idea. Uh, what if we do this, guys? Or here's something that might work for you. Or please let me try to come up with a solution. You usually are the friend that everyone comes to because you can generate ideas pretty quickly. Um, wonderful in roles that involve in innovation, creativity, and problem solving. Invention can also be decorating. I love to decorate. I love to reimagine a room and, and use that creativity. So what I crave is freedom. But don't put me in a box. I could never work in a factory doing the same thing day in and day out. I would lose my ever-living mind. So I don't want to be put in a box. I want to have freedom to create, and I'm crushed by constraint. Knowing that, if you have inventors on your team or in your family, then you will know that they will want to do things their way. That's why I hated school so much. What is school? All tenacity. Do it this way, do it this way every time, and we, we test everyone the same exact way, and then you all get a grade the same. It puts everyone in a box. And that, I think, uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school creates entrepreneurs because they're just thinking of how to get the hell out of here. <laughs> all right. So if you're an inventor, circle it up. Discernment. So these are our Debbie Downers. I'm also a D. I'm an ID. So we use instinct and gut intuition and have an uncanny judgment to evaluate and assess ideas or plans without a lot of information, meaning I could probably come into an organization that isn't real estate, observe the environment, watch what everyone's doing, and come up with a reason that things are failing. Even though I don't know the industry, it's just a gut instinct. So all my life I've always said, I follow my gut, I follow my gut. I didn't know that some people don't have that. My mother-in-law has no gut. Her D is a frustration. She'll say, I have no gut. If I meet someone, I don't know if they're good or bad. I'm indifferent about it. I'll know if they're good or bad after I meet them and then they do something to me, but I don't have a gut, Tina. And I'm like, that's the weirdest thing. So they will say things like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea, or sorry, this isn't going to work, or I think you're onto something. Keep going because they're following their gut. I think I know what we need to change. Trust me, I just know. That is the famous line. I, used, I say that to my husband, I'll just trust me, I know. When I got the news about EXP and I watched the video, I think it might have been Brent's video, 
I woke him up at like 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, this is the answer. We had just moved to Keller Williams. And I'm like, this is going to work. He's like, go to bed. Like, what are we talking about here? So the next morning, I made him watch it. He didn't have a gut instinct on whether or not it would be good or bad. I just knew. And I just said, trust me, I know. And so they're wonderful in roles where they're making decisions, they're giving sound advice, and they're good like consultants, judge, editor. You know, they're looking for problems. And so what they crave is trust. If you say to somebody who's a discerner, prove it, they get mad at you. Because they're like, I don't know how to prove it. you got to just trust me. Who has a friend like that or a family member? Or who is like that? Yeah, just trust me. I know. And people think you're a know-it-all. That's not that. <laughs> we just have a gut instinct. All right, discerners. Galvanizers. So again, this is going back to Brent. I think he is... Number one in galvanizing, so rallying, organizing, recruiting, inspiring people to take action around ideas, projects, and tasks. These people, you'll see them in a crowd. They'll tend to say, come on, everyone, this is a huge opportunity. we got to do it. Or are we all on board with making this offer? Like you're galvanizing your own clients. You're like, come on, yeah, we looked at three today. That first one, that's the one. That's a galvanizer. Do you understand why we need to do this? They just can't hide their excitement. Like it's just coming out of their veins. And so they're great in roles where they're energizing and motivating people. So they're like a good coach, a team leader, a sales manager. I would never want a non-galvanizer to lead my team. They have to have energy and excitement and enthusiasm. And so what they crave, though, is reaction. And they're crushed by apathy. So if you guys aren't getting on your feet and getting excited, Brent's going to be like, well, do they like it? I don't know. Like, what's going on? So he wants a reaction. And if he got off stage and said, how did I do? And I went, eh, he'd probably be bummed. He wants to know you did great or you could do this better. They want to know yes or no. I mean, you, they're okay with feedback, but you've got to give them reaction. If you're on a Zoom with some of these people and all the cameras are off, they're annoyed because they want to see your smiling faces. They want reaction. So if you're a galvanizer, put a little star there. Enablement. This sounds like a negative, like, oh, you're such an enabler. This is not what it means. The enablement means that you are you are looking at the environment and you are responding to the needs of others before they even know they need it. So you're just always on the lookout to help people, to support, to assist in projects and tasks. You get a joy out of responding to the needs of others. A lot of people, you can wear yourselves out. You could say, gosh, I'm always doing things for other people, not myself. It's because you actually like it. And these people tend to say, like, I've heard enough. Sign me up. Or let me know how I can help. I'm, I'm honored to do it. I'm a team player. This is why you need a lot of enablement people on a team or it won't function. Um, I want to help make this successful. What do you need from me? It's always about the other person. They're great in roles that involve helping others, like customer service, human resources, teachers, and agents, because we love helping others. They crave, though, appreciation, and they are crushed by being overlooked. So if you have an assistant or a manager or any in your family, your husband, your wife, if they want appreciation and you can't appreciate them or give them that feedback, they're going to be crushed. They're going to be bummed out because you're overlooking them. You're not seeing that they're washing the dishes or doing all the laundry. To thank your husband and wife, thank you. I know you stayed home with the kids all day and you got all that laundry done. I see you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Even though some of us will go, well, that's your job. Like, I'm working all day and you're, right? Have you ever heard that? Well, that's your job. You're supposed to do that. Yeah, but some people crave that extra level of appreciation. So it's not that they just want a pat on the back, because some of us feel that way that are low E's. My E is at the bottom. You don't need to pat me on the back after this and go, great job, thank you for doing it. I'm indifferent about it. Like, I'm just happy I could give back, but it doesn't, I don't need that to be seen and to be appreciated. I didn't know that people needed that appreciation because I don't need that. But if you have a spouse or a, a child or a business partner that needs that, you better know because you better be appreciating them all the time. So last but not least, my favorite people on the planet, because I'm also a low T, tenacity. They get satisfaction and energy by pushing projects and tasks through to the finish line. They love crossing things off their list. So these people wake up with checklists, and they love to get the, the list done. And they'll say things like, this is going to get done today. We need to raise our standards here. I will hit this deadline. Here, let me do it. They'll actually pull things out of your hands. 
and failure is not a word in their vocabulary. So they're perfect in roles that have discipline, seeing things like operations managers, project coordinators, accountants, your assistants. So they crave clarity, tell me exactly what you want me to do, and they're crushed by ambiguity. So there was a um, Ashley on our team, our operations manager, Daria, is, an, is a T, a DT. And she asked Ashley to give a presentation. Ashley's like, I'm going to wing it because she's a W, right? Well, I'm going to just wing it and whatever comes to me comes. And Daria's like, no, I need to know the steps. And they kind of butted heads. And we had to stop and remind them that, hey, Daria just needs clarity and she's process driven and you're not. And W is one of Daria's frustrations. So after they talked, she's like, okay, fine. Here's what I'm going to do, Daria. And Daria's like, okay, fine. I've got clarity. So if those two didn't know that about each other, it would look like they have a power struggle. It's not a power struggle. It's not do it my way. It's I need to understand. Please, Ashley, help me understand what the hell you're going to say to our people in front of the room. At least give me an outline. And then that gives her clarity, and she feels satiated. She doesn't have ambiguity, where Ashley loves ambiguity. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. That's totally comfortable for her, not for you T's. Okay, so look at your paper. Everyone should have, and we can go back through these. Um, is there any runners that I want to do a little question and, and, and pick on some people no, in a nice way. Um, does everyone have two circled that they believe are their geniuses? Like, yes, these are totally me. Ooh, I see one here. And then two frustrations, like these are totally not me. I got some people. Okay, good. The two that you haven't touched that you're kind of indifferent about, those are called your competencies. My competencies are G, so galvanizing. And my competency, competency is W, meaning I can galvanize to a point. It doesn't fill my cup, but it doesn't deplete me. So I want you guys to think of this. Your hell yes. I'm pouring, your genius is pouring coffee into a thermos. It's going to keep the heat for a long time. You're going to love doing these things for a long time. That's your genius. It doesn't even feel like work. Your competency in the middle is like pouring coffee into a styrofoam cup. It can keep the heat for a while, but after a while, the coffee's going to get cold. So for me, galvanizing, if I had to do what Brent does all the time, I could not do that job. It would wear me out, and I know it. I don't even like doing it for our team. That's why I have team leaders, because I don't like giving those presentations all the time. And then your, your frustration is like pouring coffee into a styrofoam cup with a hole in it. You're going to pour the coffee in, and the hole, it's depleting you immediately. It's your frustration. So for me to fill out spreadsheets and do that kind of work, frustrated completely. I don't want to do it. So the mic is out. You raised your hand, so let's start with you. What are your two geniuses, do you believe? This is interactive. We're all friends. I think it would be the WI. WI. Oh, good. Yeah. That's, Ash that's Ashley, WI. So what, what resonates with you about the W? The wondering. Um, I'm always just daydreaming with ideas, just trying to improve things. Trying to prove things are accurate. Impro or improve them. And it's ex exhausting a little bit? No, it's not exhausting. Oh, you like it? I like okay, it. Okay, good, good. Okay, I love that. So it's a W. And then the I is inventions, like solutions for things. Have I, you invented I love anything? Created, uh, yeah, in my mind, I just haven't got them done. So a lot. Of <laughs> you need a tenacity person. Yes, I do. Yes, yeah. I do. What are your bottom, your two bottom? Um, I would say E.T., E.T., me yeah. too. Yeah. It's exhausting. Exhausting. Like paying the bills. Out. If I said you have to pay the bills at home today, would you be uh, like, oh. yeah, see, uh, my husband and I used to fight about paying the bills because we both are E.T. at the bottom. We have lawn people. We have cleaners. We have laundry people. We have a lady now that comes and pays all our bills. All tenacity work. Think about it. We thought we were just like being pompous. No, we just hate that stuff. So yeah. we just pay to get people to do it now. Yeah, It's wonderful. It, you really spoke to me about the gavel. I, what did you call it? The Galvanizing? Team. Yeah, I can do that, but just short periods of time. Short I can't periods do of that time, right? Short periods of time, yeah. Brent, do you love galvanizing? Does it give you energy? Yes. So naturally, if we had a team, you and I would say, let's let Brent do it. And we'd ask, hey, Brent, do you want to open the meeting today? And be like, yeah. But knowing that about him, right? So you know your people. When you're the CEO of your business, you have to know people really, really well. It helps you become a better manager, better leader. Um, I love that. Okay. And then anything in your life that you can resonate with, spouse or family, that would drive them crazy about your WIing? This is my wife next to me. Oh, I hi, drive her wife. crazy constantly. 
Sophia. Is that yeah. accurate? We should ask her. <laughs> so does he constantly have ideas and spin in circles? Yes, and I'm definitely the tenacity one. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that would be mine, the tenacity. Brent has me in the correct role because I handle all of his onboarding. Mm -hmm. So I like to improve it. I like to get it done. I like list. I like yeah. things to be accomplished. Yeah. Um, and my lows would be the W and the D. See, there you go. And yeah. that's why it's so, like, you need each other. Now you guys have four of the six geniuses together as a partnership. Mm -hmm. And when you can look at that and say, where are our gaps? Because I'll show you at the end, you can do a team map, even in a family. Where are the gaps? What are we missing? If you're missing that and you guys are about to do a really big decision, you start with Mr. W.I. over here <laughs> and we start wondering and pondering, right? And yeah. then you're saying your, your D is at the bottom, your, your gut, or no. I think so. I guess I didn't really understand it, the D. The D is the discernment. You're poking holes in things, but you're following your gut. You're saying my gut tells me this is right or wrong. Oh. And a lot of people don't have that. And you read a lot of books that says follow your gut. Sorry, not everyone has one. Maybe the WI then. <laughs> WI, yeah. Yeah, I love it. All right, cool. Well, good. I hope that was helpful. Who's next? Let's hear some more. I love to hear the ahas after this. There's one in the back. Good morning. Good Audrey morning. with uh, Magania Realty. Um, my first genius, I picked Wander because mm -hmm. I like to wander. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my second genius... I pick discernment. Discernment. Okay, yes. WD. So the wondering. A lot of times this is a very overlooked genius because people don't know how to pinpoint it. And so like one of my friends who's a W, he's like, I feel like I could do a lot of things pretty well, but I can never land on one to be masterful at. Absolutely. Is that that's fair? Yes, that's something that I internally struggle with. Yeah. Which way am I, which path am I going to pick? Which path? Because there's so many possibilities. There's, I could do it all. That's right. Right. And you can't land on a decision. So for W's for you, what would be helpful is, and Ashley and I did this on a plane one day, and she's like, organize my life. And so we sat down and we literally made a list of everything she needed to do to execute because she can't figure out the path sometimes. But when you tell them this is the path, then they can go. So luckily that's my middle phase not mm -hmm. the not the thermos but not the styrofoam with that's the your hole. competency yes i can make a list and good. go with that your tenacity good i yes. love it i love it and what's your frustration actually it's what my wife is good at which is invention and enablement she those are her geniuses so i love it we'll pass the mic yes. to wifey <laughs> hi hello <laughs> So, so does that resonate with you, the fact that she's describing herself as a W, always in her head, pondering, spinning in circles? Yes, because when she's wondering, I start coming up with solutions. How, how do we get it done? And then she discerns through the you know, possibilities, and then I galvanize and enable, and then she sees it through to the finish line. So. I love it. And when you say enablement for those in the room, what does that mean to you when, when we were describing that, like helping others? So it just, I mean, I love helping people. So part of the reason I'm in, in real estate, so it's how, how am I going to get the job done? What do you need from me to make sure that we can get this done? Yeah. And, and then once they tell me, it's a, now I'm taking action to make sure it happens. Yeah. And think about this. I used to, I was always beating myself up because I'm like, I love helping people. <laughs> like, I love helping people. But my ease at the bottom when I actually took the real test. I love helping people solve problems because I'm an I. So when you come to me and you say, I have a problem, I'm like, ooh, yeah, I'm helping you. But I don't love, so here's the perfect example. I'm at my son's basketball game. He's in elementary school. And the game is done, yay! And we're all walking across the gym, and over there, all the parents are stacking chairs. I don't have enablement, so I don't feel guilty walking away. <laughs> Bye! I gotta go! That's really a non-enabler. But you would have to stop and help because you would feel guilty, yes? Yes, we were okay. on a walk one day, and a uh, family dropped a baby bottle, and I said, oh, I should help, and she said, no, just leave exactly. it. And I was like, but I want to help, you know. So, exactly. Yeah, so absolutely. some of us might think, oh, well, I love helping people. Yeah, but doing the genius that you love helping. So I love to invent and poke holes in things, and therefore I'm helpful, but on my terms, not yours. So I don't want to help with the bake sale. It sounds boring. And I can say that and move on with life, but other people would be like, oh, I just feel like I have to help. So I love that. All right, let's do, let's do another one. Uh, my name is David Palma, and I'm with the XP. 
Hi, so David. So I'm a widget. You're all you're all six. You are. All of us are a widget. Yeah. We'd all like to think that, but um, I truly do geek out on all this. I love business and I love Good. all of it. But if I really look at it, I think I'm an IE. IE. Okay. So you but would stop and stack the chairs in the gym. I did last night. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. <laughs> So I have a team, and I'm always helping people. And if I think I had financial freedom, I would like to help. I get passion from that. Mm -hmm. But I complain about it the most. Mm, okay. So I don't know. You can Well, probably because you just feel the need to have to help. And it's pulling you. And it's like, man, I never can do the things I want to do because I'm always helping others. And I think that's a frustration for ease. They just feel exhausted all the time. They're always helping others. They're always putting others first. And sometimes we have to be selfish and put ourselves first. So you got to decide where that line is. Exactly. Like, I can't help today. Sorry. Like, I take time and I move on with life. But I don't have that guilt. Mm -hmm. You just have the guilt. Mm -hmm. Because all of us are, are widget. We all have the ability to come up with an idea. We all have the ability to wonder and ponder at times. Remember, widget is finding your joy. Your, woo, my hell yes. Because if you're in a business and you're having a meeting, it's knowing your people to say, who are we going to pull into this ideation meeting right now? Where are my W, I's, and D's? They want to be in those meetings. But you ask an ET to come into an ideation meeting where no one can make, no one knows what's going on and people are whiteboarding and throwing things against the wall. The ETs are like bored. They're like, call us back when you figured out what we're doing because I'm bored now. Who's, who's a T in the room that can identify with that? Yes. She's like, tell me the plan and then... Call me back in when you're ready. Yeah. So. So I think it's just hard to leverage. I mean, I've struggled with that for over a decade now, building the team and mm -hmm. delegating out. And mm -hmm. It just seems to always fail. I think this would be a good step to, yeah. to implement. Yeah. I can, you can, if you have everybody on your team do this, this test, I can come in and within an hour, we put everyone in a box and we show you where the, the gaps are. And it's really helpful because you can immediately see what's missing. Like our team had low ET. Um, actually, that brings up a great, I'm going to show you guys this. Okay, so that's my working genius. So here is our, our team. So this is, the, this is called a team map. This is our team today. So Kevin, my husband, and Jessica are our, our, our staff W's. You can see all the people that it frustrates. <laughs> so if you go to Jenny, who's my assistant, Heather, and, and you start, these two start going in circles and pondering, they're like annoyed. Um, but we need them because Kevin will come in, and Ashley can attest to this, the energy's off, something's missing. And I'm like, well, what is it? He's like, I don't know, something's missing, something's off. And so then we got to dig deeper. He's got that W thing. Over here, we've got invention. So my new hire, Jeff, who's our team leader now, has invention. And you can see this is a frustration for a lot of our staff. So they don't easily, if I went to Heather or Terry or Ildico and said, hey, can you guys give me some ideas of what we should do for this party or whatever, they'd be like, ah, you know, it's hard for them. So we would not call on those people because they're, that's their frustration. Discernment, we have a really good team of discerners. So we dissect everything on our team. Um, and you can see only one person doesn't have discernment. And then galvanizing, we have two. So when we ask these people to go do something or push people, they're the ones we can sometimes call them like the pushy douchebag. So this is why. <laughs> Let's say we're all at a conference room and no one's paying attention and we got to start the meeting. The G would be like, come on, everybody, close your laptops. We got we to gotta do this, right? They're pushing people to move into action. So we only have a couple of those. And then lots of enablement now and lots of tenacity. This is where our weakness was on our team, and look at how we've stacked it. Now all of a sudden things, the trains are leaving the station mm -hmm. because we've got the right people helping, and then we've got the right strength moving and closing things out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. It's a great tool. Um, but again, in a family of two people, you only have four that are really going to bring you joy. And this is about bringing you joy, all of you, your people, your partners, what brings them joy. So let's do one more, and then we'll move on to the next, to make sure we're in time. OK. Hello, I'm Hello. Jennifer Meek with EXP. Um, I definitely am not a W. I'm an invention, inventor. Um, and my husband right here is Gary Meek. We, um, 
He confirmed that. We confirmed, <laughs> he confirmed that's it. Really oh, good. That's good. you. That's you. <laughs> um, and I thought that I was an enabler, but once you said, I'm like you, I want to solve problems for other people, I don't necessarily, I would definitely be like, yeah, I'm out. I don't, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm not, not stacking helping, the chairs. I don't need to help yeah. you do that. Yeah. <laughs> Gary, go help. Right. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Like, you'll know all the enablers. They'll be staying uh, around, stacking chairs no, after no, this event. No, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and then I also thought maybe I was a galvanizer, which I think I am, especially when you were like, close your books. I'm a little That's bossy you. that yeah. way. Yep. Yeah. But I think discernment also. I think I am definitely have gut feeling. I think I can read people. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, I, I'm not positive, but yeah, it, this is mind blowing really. I mean, there's so many other things we've read lots of books, like you're wired that way. And of course the disc and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but they're all different. They're, and this is very different. It's very different, but it, where, again, it's where you find joy because mm -hmm. the, the disc, we all love the disc, but sure. it's behavioral. Mm -hmm. I was a high D for my whole life because oh, I had to be, yes. but I'm really yeah. not like oh. if we go on vacation, I'm like, Lead the way, Kevin. I don't care. I'm not making a decision, but I had to be. Yeah. So it's behavioral based on your environment. Mm -hmm. This is just joy and energy, which imagine having a staff that's full of joy and energy because they're leaping out of bed. Yeah. So uh, what is your frustration, you said? Uh, well, my frustration, um, I think, is that I, I just didn't, well, yeah, it's, it's what brings you joy. That's, mm -hmm. that's really the biggest thing. And, well, I was going to say, too, there's another book that Jay Kinder, honey, what's that called? The... Rocket, Rocket fuel, fuel yeah. yeah. We do that so too, yeah. Gary and S Steve Hillier is our partner also, and um, they've been reading that and helping because it's like, who, you know, everybody's like, you should be doing what I'm doing to get us all, but we all have different roles. Everybody, ha yes. And this to me is just, <laughs> duh. It, you know, to help everybody be happy. I mean, that's what correct. we want, right? Because so. some people can be visionary, yeah. but they're not in a visionary role. Right, so right. you can't have 15 visionaries mm -hmm. on a team. That mm -hmm. would be all the WIs. Right, right. Nothing would get done. Yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously. And so when you really pinpoint it down, mm -hmm. it really starts to help. Well, um, yeah. And I mean, it's helpful for people to recognize that about themselves and about the people that you're working with. Because Correct. for me, I mean, I'm like, why can I not finish something? Why right. Can, and and because it doesn't do bring you joy. It doesn't. Yeah. I, you have to now, you'll finish something out. that brings you joy. Mm -hmm. So everyone can finish mm -hmm. projects, but they mm -hmm. decide yeah. which ones to finish when they have low tenacity. Right. I'll do this because mm -hmm. I like it, but the rest mm -hmm. won't get done. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, here's a perfect example. I went through three assistants. All of my first three were all galvanizer, um, wonderer inventors. Why did I hire them? Because they were just like me. I liked them. I'm like, this person's fun. We had all these ideas. We sat in sessions before I hired them. And what I found is that they were, their resume showed that they were, um, uh, you know, trained to be assistants, but it didn't bring them joy. So a lot of you are doing tasks that you're trained to do. You have to do the certain things, but it doesn't bring you joy and energy. When we found the working genius and I hired Jenny, my, la my last assistant now, um, she is an ET. She loves to help and, and take care of me and make sure that everything is perfectly organized. Like we have an itinerary for Napa. Every minute of the day is planned out. That's exhausting. But Every day she comes into my office and goes, wasn't it a great day? Look at what we got done today. To her to get things done, because she's tenacity, fills her bucket. So she'll say to me, don't steal my joy. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. That's what I need. Now we're like rocket fuel, because she's in the right seat, and I'm, I have the support I need. Make sense? So was this helpful to you guys? Okay. So what I would say is, yay. Oh, I'm so glad you like it, because I love it. I geek out over it. Um, what I would say is go and take your actual test. It's 20 bucks. Go give it to every family member that you care about. My son is a GE. I know that he's going to love helping people, and he's going to be that coach role. Like he was lost in college going, what do, I don't know what I need to do, Mom. I gave him this, and the light bulb went off. He's in a frat. He's probably going to be the president of the frat, politician. I don't know, but he'll want to galvanize people like Brent. And that really helped him focus on the things that he needs to help with in college. So I think kids need this too, so they don't end up in the wrong career that their parents gave them or told them to do. So I'm so glad this really was helpful. All right, we're going to go on to the next subject. So leadership and leverage. So you guys kind of heard my story, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about leverage. And one big thing in my world that changed my world, which was, we're going to get into, but um, I was a college dropout. Again, I didn't feel really smart in school. And I think it's just because I don't test well. I mean, I, I think I am smart now. I can read books and 
you know, organize my thoughts, but not in school. I felt like I was an average, average student. Um, I talked about the market shifting. I met a magical fairy, Mike Ferry, my new mentor. We moved to North Carolina. I sold all those homes, and I finally found freedom, which was really options. So my old mantra used to be, if it's to be, it's up to me. And my coach, Kathy Anderson, from the Mike Ferry organization, sent me that little card, and I still have it on my wall today. But today, it looks a little different. I changed one word, and that word is we. And so my new mantra, if it's, it's to be, it's up to we. And when you look at you know, what you can do by leveraging yourself, by giving the gift of knowledge and giving it to many, many people when the opportunity's there, it just takes off. So when you think about a blast of the past, when it was just me, I was doing all the jobs. And some of you in this room are doing this today. You're the listing coordinator. You're the buyer closing coordinator. You're the field worker. I remember when I used to put my Remax signs in the ground and I used to jump on the damn signs to get them in the ground. Now somebody does that for us. Um, I was the ISA, the inside sales associate, and then I was the outside sales associate. So I was doing the work of an ISA every morning for three hours a day. Who does that every day for two, three hours a day? Liars. <laughs> Liars. Um, nobody likes to do that, but I did that. And so we have to do that to move our business forward, especially now because the market's changing. You go on your inspections, your marketing, your sales and training. You're doing all the things. So could I do it? Yeah. But was I efficient? No, a lot of balls were dropped. And so looking back, I'm certain I lost millions of dollars because I was too afraid to take the money I was earning and reinvest it back into the business. When I, was, when I earned my first million dollars on paper, I netted 700,000. I should have taken 200,000 and hired my first operations manager. I should have hired leverage. I should have reinvested the money back into the business to buy back my time to have more time to invent and to figure out solutions on how to grow the business, but I didn't because this is how we're taught. You just do it yourself. Think about this. Any business in the world when you open a Dairy Queen or an ice cream shop or a pizza shop, who, what's the first thing a business owner thinks about? Who am I going to hire? The workers, right? Who, who's going to work with me? They don't say, oh, I'm opening a restaurant. I'm going to be the bus girl and the bus boy, and I'm going to be the cook, and I'm going to be the owner, and I'm going to stock. No, you've got to bring people in, but not in real estate. And in 24 years, for those of you that are old like me in the room, I mean, how our paperwork has gone up. Our, like every step we do, there's like 500 things you need to do in a real estate transaction, and we still try to do it all ourselves. We'll never grow. And so when you think of why, I've asked a lot of agents in the last five years, why do they feel like they're failing at building leverage? And this is what they say. I'm too afraid to give up my clients because they just love me. Well, I sold a 1,000 homes, and trust me, I'm happy to give them away, and they're fine to go away. They think they'll give up too much money, right? So here's a perfect example. I made $7,000 a commission check when I was a solo agent, and I made $700,000 net to me. Today, my team will sell 1,000 homes. I net $2,000 per transaction. So what's 1,000 times 2,000? Exactly, right? So think about that. They think they can do it better. Well, no one's going to work as great as me. Or I don't think they can do it. I can't afford to scale. Or they don't know how to diversify, right? I just don't know how to diversify my life. Or they're too afraid to lead. This was a big one for me. Who the hell is going to follow me? What do I know? I mean, we all have that doubt. We all have that imposter syndrome, but we got to start. And there's that imposter syndrome. So most of us get into real estate because we're entrepreneurs. We want to be entrepreneurs. And so what does that mean? An entrepreneur, the definition is a person who organizes and operates a business or businesses, businesses, taking on greater than normal financial risks. So all of you in this room bet on yourselves. You said, I'm not going to work in corporate America. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to be in charge. And so I believe there's three leverage pillars in a business, systems, tech, and people. So when you think of systems, everybody's got a system to list houses right? Each one of you. You've all got a system to work with buyers. We all work with tech. We've got Zoom now. We've got all this cloud-based stuff. I mean, tech is amazing. So we all are pretty good at systems and tech. Where we fail is people leverage. That's the third one. And so 80% of agents don't know how to leverage that most important one. And so the secret sauce for me 
is surrounding myself with the right people at the right time. So to, to get the right people, we have to understand A, ourselves. So emotional intelligence, why do I do the things that I do? Why, why am I like, how am I like, what are my strengths? What am I really good at? I'm good at just a few things and I lean into those. Because if you're a, a four or a five in something and you work your ass off to be a six, you still suck. <laughs> so why not look at where am I an eight? How can I get to a 10? That's what I wanna lean in on. So whatever you're an eight, whatever people say to you naturally you're gifted at, lean into that. But a lot of people take assessments, they go, I'm weak here, I'm gonna try to build that up. For what? Like let someone else do it that's a 10 or an eight. And so it's finding the right people. So for those of you that have never read the book Think and Grow Rich, lesson two, there's 17 principles in that book. Lesson two is the mastermind alliance. How many of you are in a mastermind weekly? Like every single week? Raise your hand real high, real high. Not many, not many. So this is huge. We have literally a mastermind every day. That's a lot, but once a week. For 15 years, I have been in a, in a group of people, multiple groups sometimes, wealth building, uh, relationships, business. Every week I meet with people, people that I think are doing more than me, people that I admire, people that have good marriages, whatever it is, you got to find those people. And then you have to meet with them weekly because just like we're meeting today, hopefully my goal is you guys get one concept, you can walk out the door and implement. That's it. You did your, I did my job, you did your job. Now you got to go take action on it. So the Mastermind Alliance is basically the key to scaling a profitable business. If you guys are going so fast every day in your business, right? the deals, the deals, the deals. But when do we ever slow down to take time to learn something to go faster? My coach would say, slow down to go fast. And I never really kind of got that until I got that. And now I go really slow to make sure that we do things faster. So let's be honest, who, who meets weekly? There were a few of you in the room. And what's holding you back? How could that change your business? So here's a couple examples. Um, this gal named Anna Powell, so we met her. She was a solo agent doing about 25 transactions herself. She had been in the business for many years, and she was the got a minute girl at her office. How many of you are the got a minute guy or girl? Hey, got a minute, got a minute. People knock, knock on your door, and you're always giving away these free minutes, and it's fine. But what we said to Anna was, Anna, if you love giving back because she's a dub, uh, an IE, she loves to help people, and she loves to invent, why don't you just start to grow a team? And that scared her. She's like, well, I've never done it. That's okay. You've got our mastermind. Every week, Anna showed up, sometimes twice, and she went from a solo agent a year and a half ago. She has 25 agents on her team. They're going to do 225 transactions, and she built a network at eXp of 130 agents in 14 months. It can be done, but you just need the guts to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try, but I'm going to show up. And this girl shows up. Um, Ashley, who you, I've been talking about over there, so she's on my team. So she has a team. She went out and she recruited Anna, actually. So think about that. Agent on my team. For a lot of you, how many are on a team in this room? Yes, a lot of you. Ashley doesn't need to leave my team. We talked about it. We can do the numbers. We can do the math. She finds value to stay on the team. Why? Because we've leveraged her business. She makes a lot more per hour being on a team, giving 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30 on whatever deals, but she was able to grow a team and take action. So she went and recruited, you know, um, and inspired Anna to do something different. So they're in masterminds every single week on Wednesdays. She still sells 30 to 40 homes on the team, makes a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. She does coaching. She's building a social media course. It's creating different streams of income. And that's the key is how do we scale ourselves and leverage ourselves so we can do different things. So time is money. We use it for earning money. We use time for earning money, but what's important to understand is we cannot use the money to get lost time back. So how do you guys get more money? You can stay small, stay solo, or realize that your network is your net worth. So who are you around? Who is giving you new concepts for you guys to learn and to grow? And so most millionaires have seven or more vehicles of income. They know their net worth. And they always have a plan to grow it. So I remember the first time somebody asked me, do you know your net worth? What's your net worth? And I was like, I have no clue what that is. I didn't know. We didn't talk about money. Who talked to, who, who had a family where they said, money doesn't grow on trees? Who said, yeah, all of you are laughing because we all grew up in the same family. So 
it's nobody teaches us that concept because we're we are built to play small we're built to go to school and go work for factories and you know work for other people not for ourselves and so you want to think of how you can get into a network that makes your income grow so this is the part where i hope that you guys have a big enough you know you can embrace this and not feel like oh she's just up there telling us how wonderful she is this is not what that's about this is the fact that five years ago i woke up and i said my god the only way I know how to make money is go sell a house and go do it at a high level. And I was exhausted. And so that was it. If I got hit by a bus or I was sick or I fell off a roof like one of my friends did and could, didn't have any money to go or didn't have a, a back to actually go sell homes, why the hell was he on the roof? He, you know, we would be screwed. So how many of you in this room, if you didn't have a home to sell, where is the passive income coming from? Where is the money coming from? So what I want you guys to look at is these 12 streams were created in five years because of masterminds and so what I want you to do today is think of how could I grow my business how could I build one of these streams so our team this is a little bit older I mean we'll be probably closer to two million this year but the net cash flow from the team we have leveraged leadership we were able to pay out four and a half million dollars to our agents to live their unreal lives but as we started to grow the team, so does the income. And so you can build a team. There's a, amazing team leaders at our firm and other firms that can help. Um, your stocks. So for 15 years, Kevin and I did the, um, uh, what was it called? Dave Ramsey. Who follows Dave Ramsey? And we took that little 10, 15% of our income, whatever maxed out. Every single year we paid ourselves first. And that turned into $800,000. Now that goes up and down. I know people look at their stocks all the time. We don't, we just let it sit there. And it's been about seven to 8% yearly. So contributing $19,000 for 15 years has grown. So if you're in real estate and you're not paying yourselves first, the compounding does happen. And it's not sexy, but it does work. And it's kind of boring to get rich. Um, company stock program. Some of you work at companies with stock program. That worked for us and we've been doing it and that's a little bit of our retirement planning. I do think that we are in a growth uh, spurt for our company. So you can do that. Invest in what you sell. So we purchased 10 long-term rental homes in the last seven years. We took, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 when we got it selling in higher volume and we would go and buy rental assets. So this is $800,000 in payment down payments but that's only $4,000 a month in passive income. So if we couldn't work today, it's hard to live on $4,000. You need more than that. But when we're 65 and 70, if all these homes are paid for, and they're maybe $2,000 each, that's 20 grand a month. I can live on 20 grand a month at 65. It's not too bad. So why are we not buying what we're selling? We should all be buying what we're selling, all of us right now. Let it compound. Airbnb, we had a little uh, Airbnb. I'll never do it again. How many of you have an Airbnb? It's like running a mini hotel. And so we have an Airbnb, payments 1300, we average cash flow 3700 a month. Great investment. But you know, you get people that call you for every little thing that goes wrong. Not my favorite, but we'll keep this one. Um, we have a revenue share program at our company. I have to do this disclaimer. But that is right now for coaching pay. It's 60k a month. Why? Because I'm pouring back into people. I took all the knowledge in my brain and I pour it back into our network. So for those of you that are not with a company that offers this in this room, it's something to think about if you love coaching and training, sharing your tribal knowledge. Syndications, I heard that word three years ago, did not know what it was. And that is a really cool group of investors that come together. We've purchased over, I think, a thousand doors now. We invest anywhere from 50,000, 150,000, up to a million dollars if you want, and great returns. We're averaging 15 and 20% returns. They send us a check every quarter. I don't have to buy things for the house. I don't have to worry about anything. It's great. And so it helped us create affordable housing. Uh, company referral network. Last year we made 200 grand just referring people. So talk to each other in the room, get on social media and build a network. Affiliate agreements. How many of you have an affiliate agreement with a product? Yes, a few of you. I love that. Kyle Whistle taught me that. Every time he would say something in one of our masterminds, he would talk about affiliates. And when I asked him, pulled him aside, he said, well, Tina, there's things that you love and you talk about all the time on your YouTube channel or Instagram. And I said, yeah. He goes, call the companies and say, hi, do you have affiliate agreements for the people that pitch your products? And I called all the companies that I loved and they all signed me up and I bring in 
you know, $2,000 to $2,500 per month on affiliate agreements. I mean, every time I say the word Red X on YouTube, somebody signs up for Red X, I get a little check in the mail. So think about how you guys love the products that you work with and who could you uh, talk to to do that. Title company for those team leaders in the room. You know, if you're doing 100 units or more, you could open up a title company, which we did, which brings in another passive income stream. One-on-one -on -one coaching. I tried this with five agents. I did not love it because when, the, when I invented for them and told them what to do and then they didn't do it week after week, I had to galvanize them. And what does that do for me? Exhausting. So I stopped that, but that was $3,000 a month they were paying me. That's another 15 grand. Guys, to make 3,000 a month in passive income, you need a million dollars in the bank at a 4% return. It's hard to make passive income. Really, really hard, but there are ways to do it. We did a little 90-day relaunch, a little 30-page little, um, uh, PDF. We took everything in my brain, put it down on paper. We sold it on uh, ads on Facebook, $97. That makes 20000 a month. All of you in this room are really smart, and you all have really cool systems, especially you T's. If you T's take your checklists and you start promoting those out to the realtor community, guess what you're going to make? Money! Lots of money. So you guys have a lot of things that you could give that will turn into money. So there's 12 streams of income and counting. So turn to your neighbor and say, what other streams could we add? Turn to your neighbor. What other streams could you guys add? <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. You could build your YouTube channel. You could have a stand store. You could sell coaching products. So what's next for you guys? Yeah. So the last thing that we're going to go through today is something I call, you know, find your calling. It's play on words because my last name is Call. Um, but it's from process to purpose. And I think that, you know, when we think about our life, um, our life vision, you know, I, I, I have to tell you guys a story. Um, when I was 15, so I came from an immigrant family. My dad speaks Greek. My mother's Italian, and they have heavy accents. And my dad, um, you know, came to this country when he was 27, and he met a guy named Joe, and he worked at a restaurant. My dad was a cook his whole life and owned a couple of restaurants. He failed at every business he started except when he turned 70, and he opened up a little night light business in, in uh, Florida, and he sold night lights on a pier, and he made a hundred grand a year as a seven year old. Like, it took him that long, but he had lots of failed businesses, even quail, raising quail. My mother thought he was a moron. They're divorced. Um, they like each other now, but now, now with the working genius, I could totally have helped them, but I didn't have that then. So, anyway, um, my dad met Joe at a restaurant. And uh, he wanted to find a wife. And so Joe said, hey, I hit the mother load in Detroit. I met a family of seven daughters. I married one, Rose. So he took my dad over to my grandmother's house. And literally, my grandmother lined up the daughters. And my dad picked my Aunt Frances. They went out on a date. He didn't like her, and he returned her. <laughs> it's a true story. And then he was like, I like that one. And so then he took my mother, Domenica, and they went out on a date, couple dates, and then they got married. Um, and he could hardly speak really good English. I'm like, Mom, why did you marry him? She's like, well, that's just what you do back then. And I wanted to get out of the house because your grandma used to throw shoes at us when we didn't clean our room. So lots of dysfunction. Anyway, um, they got married, and um, they never got along. They always fought about money. And my dad was a dreamer. My dad is an I. I think he's an IG, so double disruptive. Um, lots of ideas, and he'd go right into action, right into action. And my mom is a discerner tenacity. This is a dumb idea. This is stupid. Why don't you believing in my dreams? That was my childhood. Um, so they finally broke up. But he came into my room um, when I was 15 years old, and he sat on my bed, and he's like, Martina, sit down. That's my real name, Martina. But I went to school with Jennies and Susies, and I wanted to be, you know, well-liked and accepted, so I just changed it to Tina. Um, anyway, he sat down and he said, Martina, I want you to hear me. I want you to be successful in life, and I have an idea. And I said, oh, okay. He said, I want you to marry Tommy Vasilos. 
Tommy comes from a rich Greek family. They have homes in Greece, and you can have babies and be Tommy's wife, and you will be taken care of, and you don't have to be, you know, frustrated like your mom and I basically about money. And he was doing what any loving father would do. He was trying to protect me, put me in a household where I could be the queen of my castle. I don't know. I don't cook and I don't clean. So that was like... I knew in my gut with my discernment sitting on that bed when I was 15, all I kept saying was, hell no, sound the alarms. Like alarms are going off because Tommy was my boss. He was 25 or 6 at the time. I'm 15. So number one, that's creepy, but that's Greek men for you. Um, Get them young. Um, It's really creepy. But I knew in that moment, at 15 years old, I set a vision. And my vision was, I will never marry a foreigner. Because all I knew was Italian Greek men in my life. And all that they wanted their wives to do was cook and clean and bear children. And so that was not in my vision. So I'm like, I'm going to marry an Americanized man from a really awesome, you know, apple pie family. And what did I find? A year later, I met Kevin Call. And so I got to find my life partner really young, and he is like the best man I could have ever ordered on the planet. Um, And so thinking about that, I was like, I set the vision. I I didn't know I was doing it, but I did it. And then when I was 28, when the market was crashing, remember I told you guys the market was crashing, I lost all my income, I met Mike Ferry, who cast a vision again for me, and I sat in the back of the room, 4,000 agents here in, um, we were in San Diego, San Diego, and he was broke, grew up in a, in a trailer, parents were alcoholics, and he sat on stage saying, I'm worth $100 million, if I can do it, you can do it too, through real estate, and I remember people dressed up really nice in the front row, and he said, hey, if you want to be you know, in the front row, that's where you want to be, these are the people that have done it. And I remember moving up to the front row because I wanted to be there. So he wasn't my mentor day one because I didn't know him, but he was my mentor. Because when somebody casts a vision for you, you you can't reverse it. Like they've shown you something. And so what he showed me was that anyone could make it. Anyone could be wealthy and have freedom. So for me, I'm driven by fear, fear of not having enough, fear of, you know, living like my parents paycheck to paycheck. And so fear drove me, but I, I needed to get to a point where I felt safe. And now my, my goal for you guys is you're the pilot of your plane. You have to set the vision. It's not your, your family's vision. It's not your husband or spouse's vision. It's your vision. What is that? And a lot of times, what do you always hear when people speak? They say, what's your why? What do we always say when, when, when people ask us that? What's your why? What do you say? Family, Jesus, right? We always go back to my family. My why is my family. I do this for my kids. I do this for my spouse. We get that because the first human need is that you have to protect yourself. I mean, that's what cavemen used to do. They used to wake up in their caves and go, okay, the kids, everybody good? No one's eaten by a bear? Fine, we're good. We're safe. And you're, you're naturally wired to f- want to feel safe. And so, so that is your why. I want to feel safe. So for me... Crafting my vision was actually getting really emotional about it. It's what do I want my life to look like? Not who am I doing it for or the why. What does it look like? What kind of clothes do I wear? What kind of car do I drive? Where do I live? How do I travel? Who are my friends? And when I was taught to do this, to visualize, it's the, the missing key of it is emotion. Attaching emotion to the visualization. So when you guys are laying in bed tonight... I would encourage you, because some of you are going, well, I don't have those ideas. And so sometimes it's hard to come up with the ideas and you start modeling other people's lives. That's okay, right? I mean, maybe you want to travel to Africa and save people in villages. Maybe you want to plant a garden all day. Whatever your vision is, that's your vision. So start writing it out. But then after you write it out, because I've seen a lot of your dream boards, they're just dreams on boards, and we don't do anything else with them. But when you sit down at night, I remember Kevin and I used to literally lay in our bed and we used to close our eyes and we used to put the um, uh, Carolina song on. Who's the guy that uh, sang that song? James Taylor, thank you. And we used to put James Taylor on and when we were in Michigan and we used to, Carolina on my mind, and we would listen to that song and our job was to visualize living there. And like sometimes it would bring tears to my eyes. I wasn't even there. I was sitting in Michigan, but I was visualizing it because this is what it looks like. And so 
this little graph thing that I came up with is to help you guys sort of plant the vision, but know that it's going to take time to get there. Um, and so this is what I came up with laying in bed um, one night for our agents, and I'll explain it. So I call it our six Ps from process to purpose. So a lot of you in this room have been in real estate under a year. Raise your hands. Under a year? Okay, good. Under five years? Over 10 years? Oh, good, a lot of you. Okay. So what I was finding is that agents would join our team, and Ashley's been with us for nine years. She's in a different part of her life. You guys saw that she's got a 130 agents now. She coaches and does all these wonderful things. When you're a new agent on our team and you're struggling and you're trying to sell homes and then you're comparing Ashley's sales with yours, they're comparing Ashley's year nine with their year one. And so I was like, how do I help our agents understand that anything I've done in my life, it's been 24 years in business, starts with a decade-long plan. I'm going to do this in a decade. And that, I know, doesn't sound good in our TikTok world because what do we do? Scroll. Everything takes a second. You can press a button on Amazon and you got things delivered that day. I mean, we're in a world where everything's handed to you overnight, and that's the kind of kids that we're raising. So I needed a model and a graph that would show people that things take time. I came to EXP. I said, it's a 10-year plan. In 10 years, I want 5,000 agents in my organization. In 10 years. So it's not like in two years. My brother-in-law said, I'm going to have 300 people in year one. He has 10. Like, come on, <laughs> Jeff, it's going to take time. So, so what this is, is it's a graph. And it shows you that um, things obviously are a process. And this is the example that I used with my team. I set a vision for myself to play golf. How many golfers? Real golfers in here. Real golfers. Okay. So my husband handed me golf clubs before my son was born, and they, they collected dust because I didn't have a reason to pick up the golf set. But when my son was born, and by the time he was three, I started to see that my son was my husband was putting golf clubs in his hands. And so Michael was playing golf, and then he would take them and practice. And all I thought was, this is my only son. I only want one child. They're going to spend all this time together, four and five hours on a weekend, and they're going to be bonding, and then I'm going to be like the uncool mom because he's not going to want to go shopping with me, hopefully. And so what are we going to do? I have to learn how to play golf. So I went and dusted off my golf clubs, and I... I learned the process. And the vision was that when I was older, or, or my son was older, that we would spend four to five hours on the weekend together. Maybe I could golf with my grandkids, and maybe I could have a sport that in my 70s and 80s I can still do, because you can golf whatever age that you are as long as you're upright and pretty healthy, right? So with that vision, I went and hired a coach. And so what does the coach say? Okay, we got to learn the process of golf. And who has tried to swing a golf club? It's hard, right? It sucks. It's like the worst. So you're sitting there, and you're pretty good at a lot of things, and you've got now the golf club, and you're standing there, and he's teaching you how to hold it and how to put your fingers and, and the this and the that, and it is so boring. And you're like, okay, I just want to hit balls. And he's like, no, you've got to learn the process. So I was very excited. So you can see on that excitement. You know what I just realized? This is in front of me, and I've been doing this the whole time. Oh, my God. Okay. Just look up, dummy. So, all right. Excitement. This is so great. Excitement. I'm very excited about this screen right now. Learning the process. So think about that as your foundation. The process of real estate. You've got to learn how to write the contract. So you're excited when you first get your license. I'm so excited. You learn the process. So I'm learning how to swing the golf club. By year two, I'm in frustration mode. I still want to hit balls, and he's not letting me. No, you got to go practice this. you got to go practice how to hold it. you got to go practice this little thing and this little nuance. And I'm like, ugh. And every time I wanted to give up, what did I go back to? The vision. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing real estate? Why am I trying to play golf? Why? The vision is I want to play golf with my son because if I don't, my husband's going to get all that time with him. So have patience. Now we're in boredom mode, right? Years three and four. I would hit the ball, and I could get it in the air a little bit, but it was kind of boring. We're still practicing kind of the same things, but I keep focusing on that critical time frame. That first three years, even in real estate, it gets a little bit boring. Wait, I got to come in every day and make these calls, and then I got to put it in a CRM, and I got to do this mundane stuff over and over and over again. This is boring. Welcome to real estate, right? It can get boring. 
So that's the critical time frame. Now, in year four and five, that's what I always think in, in real estate, that is when you are in empowerment mode. So by year four and five playing golf, I could actually stand and approach the ball. I could take the right swing. I could have the right follow through. And about 75% of the time, the ball is going in the air like I want it. And what do I feel? Oh, empowered. I'm so empowered right now. I can actually play this sport. I got to be confident, right? Because we want to master everything on day one, and we can't. And then finally, after six, seven years of doing it, by year 10, I've been playing golf now for 15 years, I would actually take my friends that knew how to play golf and go golf alone without Kevin and Michael because I was passionate about it. The passion grew because I knew how to do the thing. And so passion can only grow once you master something. You can't be masterful about something, or you can't be passionate about something you don't master. And then finally, you have purpose. My purpose was to golf with my son. And literally, as of this past summer, he would text me and say, Mom, do you want to golf? And we'd go spend four and five hours together, just him and I. So it took 10 years for me to get really good. It took 10 years for him to grow, four to now he's, you know, 18, 19 years old. So... When you think about real estate, it takes 10 years. For those of you that are one to two years in, you're probably in process and practice mode feeling kind of excited but frustrated and maybe a little bit bored. And I find that most realtors give up by year three. They're out of the business. I mean, that's a national statistic because they thought it was going to happen faster. And they look at everybody else in the room and they go, well, that person's selling that many homes. Okay, but what year is that person in? Year 10? Stop comparing. Stop comparing. So we've got to really look at everything has a process. So the process is the first step. My first seven years, I didn't have a process. And now I do. And my life changed forever. So once I saw the process, I had direction. Then practice. So you don't want to practice imperfectly. You want to hire a coach. If this is truly your business, you got to get in a mastermind group, you have to have a mentor, you have to hire a coach, you have to take it seriously. Because if I just tried to practice golf myself, would I be practicing the correct swing? No, I would just have some weirdo swing, right? But I had a, a swing coach. I had the, you know, them telling me exactly what I was doing wrong so I could have perfect practice. And then patience. Embracing repetitious boredom. Sometimes we do something and we're like, this is boring. Is this all that it is? And I tell my agents all the time, just embrace it. Get in the office every day and put music on and just do this thing. Make make it exciting because getting rich is boring. Building a big business is boring. Getting smarter is boring, right? I mean, because you got to read books and you got to like implement things. So it can all be boring, but keep the vision in front of you. What is the vision? Why am I going to work through this boredom? right? It takes time. And so we get distracted. I think by year three, that's when I see most realtors jumping different companies. I think I'm going to go to this company now because I'm bored. I want to start over. I want that excitement again. They want to go back to day one when they were excited because they don't embrace the boredom. So you've got to have patience in everything. Power. That is by year four and five for some of you. You're going to feel that, that confidence, that poise, empowered. So you'll have consistent income. You know, when you're selling transactions and the consistency comes in, you're like, man, I did 30 transactions. I feel empowered because I'm doing the things. I'm following the process. And then again, passion. That's when something is mastered. So you can't be passionate about playing a guitar when you don't know how to play a guitar. Because people come to me, I don't know if I'm passionate about real estate. How long have you been in it? A year? I I didn't get, I was 23 when I got my license. I got my license from Jill Bomarito, who pulled me into real estate. I didn't even know what I was getting into. There was no passion there. The passion came after I was in power mode, after I knew what I was doing. So you can't be passionate about golf when you don't know how to pick up a golf club and swing it. The passion comes. And then finally, purpose. And this is where I would say is safety. Now that I'm safe, financially. Like I, Kevin and I are blessed to have more money than we ever thought we could have. We've retired our parents. We've given back. We've grown a team. I don't have that fear anymore that I'm ne- not going to have enough. And so that's when I can go to purpose. I can say, hey, maybe like I could go to those people that feel like they were, you know, not so smart in school and maybe that they feel like imposters or Kevin always says everyone's full of shit. Even your CEOs, everyone feels inadequate doing something, everybody, 
So it's just human nature. It's just we pretend. We walk around pretending we just know everything, and we don't. So the purpose for me is to empower people and just say, hey, I'm just like you, but I stuck to it. I followed a process. I had patience, and I wanted to master what I was doing. So I always had a coach. I've had 10 different coaches. And just like you were saying, like, I want to know how to do this thing. We can do it together. You know, there's, there's people in this room that have solved problems right now that would be so cool if you shared them. And the more that you share, like everything on my YouTube channel is free. I just give. And that's that abundance mindset. Just give and it comes back to you. And we just keep getting more and more and more opportunities because we just give and give and give. So you'll finally find your purpose, which I think human nature is to give back. Every time I ask a human, hey, if you had all the money in the world and you never needed to worry about money, and maybe write this question down so you guys can answer it. If I had all the money in the world, what would I wake up tomorrow and do? That is your purpose. But you can't go find that purpose until you go out and make the money. That's the problem because that's the world we live in, monopoly. We have to go have money to go live our daily lives. So having money is not a bad thing. You know, and so we were talking with some gals earlier, and I said, I don't like to buy really expensive things all the time. This dress was $8 from Shein, but my shoes were 800 from Valentino, and my assistant made me buy them. So, but it doesn't affect me either way. Like, I could still be the $8 Tina on top and the Valentina on the bottom. But the point is, like, once you get that freedom, you can go about the cabin and make choices, right? You can do what you want when you want at a time that you want, but you've got to go back to following that process to practice, to patience, to power, then your passion comes and then your purpose. And to me, purpose means I'm safe, no one's coming to get me, I've got money in the bank, and now I can go about the cabin and do what I need to do in life. And so I hope that this graph helps you kind of settle that anything that you set out to do, you've got to craft that vision and have emotion behind it. Because just putting it up on your dream board, not feeling it, crying about it, laughing about it, dreaming about it. I used to dream about the car I would drive, which was a Porsche. And I went to the dealership, and I sat in it, and I smelled it, and I touched it. And I knew that it was going to be mine, and it took four years to get it. Right? I mean, that was fun. But, I mean, think about that. So anything you do, you've got to, you've got to like, be engrossed in that thing. If you want this fancy big house or little house, whatever you want, go touch it, go feel it, go imagine it. So I think that is my time, and we wanted to open it up for some questions. We've gone through a lot today, folks, yeah? My brain hurts. My brain hurts. So let's, let's open it up for some questions. I know some of you have some on your paper. If you don't, that's okay, too. Um, but it can be working genius questions. It can be team building questions. It could be solo aging questions. Um, don't be shy because I know you guys have some. Oh, we got two over there and one here. Okay, good. Mango Watts with EXP. Um, so earlier you had mentioned uh, an investment group in, in, as another stream of income. So the mm -hmm. question that I have is, uh, how do you actually make a purchase with the investment group? Is it individuals coming together in their individual capacity in forming an agreement, or the businesses that the individuals own, they mm -hmm. form an agreement that way and then make the purchase? Yeah, so I'm not like the know-it-all of this subject, but I work with um, Centura Wealth. I think they're here in California, actually. Um, Kyle Whistle turned me on to them. They're fantastic. They vet the syndicates out. So anyone can be a syndicate. I've actually lost $100,000 on syndications. Um, it was the first one I did, and I just kind of went in blind, and we didn't know how to vet the, the person that was putting it together. So think of Grant Cardone. He does syndications, and you make about 6% on your money. He brings in all that money to Cardone Capital, and then they go out and buy apartments. You know, they'll buy an apartment for $30 million, they'll, they'll uh, upfit it, they might paint, carpet, raise the rents, because a lot of times there's, the rents haven't been raised, and then he makes a commission off the, the sale, and then they flip it in five years, and all the investors make a percentage back. But you've got to really know who you're investing with. So I would say go to some sort of wealth management company, really vet the, the syndicates, because I'm approached every week with somebody like, oh man, I'm going to be a syndicator now. Okay, 
that's like somebody getting their license. Well, I'm going to go be a new realtor now. Okay. Like, so really look at their track record and then, um, and study it before you get into it. I just trusted the first round. I'm like, this guy's smart. I'll just do what he's doing. That did not work out. So Centura Wealth, they're fantastic. Great question. All right, there was two more back here. Hey there. Leah Barraza, EXP. Excited that you're here. I'm kind of fangirling. <laughs> Yay. I had my girls come out today, too. Um, what's your, I have two questions. What book are you reading right now? Mm -hmm. And then what AI tool are you using right now? Okay, so AI tool. So I love ChatGPT. I mean, literally, guys, everything that ChatGPT does, we don't use it like we should. So think of ChatGPT as your assistant. So I took the working genius. I was on a plane, and I was like, hey, ChatGPT, study the working genius by Pat Lencioni. I put wonder, discernment, all the little things in there. And I said, give me the best jobs for each of the letters and put it in a really nice summary that is very legible and easy to read in a casual tone that a seventh grader can understand. Every chat GPT instruction for me ends that a seventh grader can understand because I don't go above a seventh grade education. Um, I'm just kidding. But the point is, like, it's really easy to understand in normal language. And so anything you do in real estate, hey, create this prompt for me. You can actually ask ChatGPT to give you the prompt that you need for what you're thinking about. I'm thinking about this prompt for this exact task. Give me the prompt that I should ask you. And then it tells you the exact prompt to ask. I mean, it's so intuitive. So I love it for literally everything. Even if it's putting together a paper that you already have, but you just want it to be organized better. And you can talk into ChatGPT, which is huge too. So I do use it for that. Um, book that I'm reading, my God, I have probably six that I've started. Um, the book that I'm reading right now, let me pull it out by my, it's actually about emotional intelligence. Um, so it's in my Audible. It's Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. That's a good one. Oh, you know which one is another good one that I just read? Um, Rene Rodriguez, uh, Leo Pereja had him speak, and he is fan freaking tastic And his book is called Amplify Your Influence by Rene Rodriguez. Um, really, really good, really good, because you guys have to influence your families, your clients. Amplify your influence, and it's an easy read, really, really easy read. I like easy reads. Great question. Hi there, Shannon Thompson with EXP. So I'm kind of where you were before you built out your business, 25 a year, almost seven years in. Where do I start? I, I know that I need to hire assistant or, or buyer's agent, but I have no idea kind of the logistics of it. So what is the split? How do I do that? Do I start with an assistant or an operations manager or a buyer's Agent, so any advice, I would love it all. Yeah. What's your average price point? Um, it really ranges because I do a lot of trust and probate deals. Mm -hmm. So it can be investment properties. Probably, I mean, it could be 400 to 1.9. Okay. It just okay. It really depends. So you're like average commissions, what, eight, nine, ten thousand? 10,000? Uh, probably 15. 15,000. Okay. Unless it's an investment property. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, like if you're doing 25 transactions, you're managing them all, you're doing everything, no assistant. So for me, what it, like what I always look at is if I say, what could I get done today? That's eight hours. If I have five people and we each have eight hours, that's a lot of time in the day that we can run as an engine. So who is going to bring the, the most ROI to the business right now. How do we get more deals? Because you have to look at more deals. And so how are you every single day doing your LLLs, lead generation, lead follow-up? Yeah, she's yeah. already going, I'm no, no, I'm no. I'm not. I'm not. only executing on the sales. Exactly. So you're actually servicing the business that's coming to you that you've mm -hmm. generated in the last however many years. So how do we grow? We have to have outbound calls. We have to have some sort of 
either social media, which there are some amazing social media people. I started in social media five years ago. It's, it's not a duplicatable thing. Like I can't walk into my office and know I'm gonna get a lead or an agent to call me. So I'm sitting there waiting for it to work. Same thing when you have a business that is referral only. I don't know when Aunt Susie's gonna tell Jenny to call me. Like I don't know, I don't have that, that feeling. So you have to have every day a routine I would get some sort of ISA, inside sales associate, $2,2500 a month, a 5% override on every deal they close you. Mm. And that way that person's sitting right next to you for three hours, five hours a day and calling. Because if I would have thought back to when I was doing it for three hours a day for five years straight, I got in the office at 7.30, 7.30 to 8, I role played, 8 to 11, I was on the phones with a 10 minute mindset break. 11 to 12, I checked email, 12 to 2, mindset, lunch, 2 to 7, appointments. But the reason I was so busy in regimen is because I was doing the morning mm -hmm. because I was always lead generating. Hey, it's Tina, I saw your home came off the market inspired listing, I'm just calling to see when you're gonna hire the next agent to list your home. And they'd go, never, and I'd go, okay, well before you go and before you hang up, just one quick question. And they go, what? Well, your home seems like it's in great condition and I'm just so curious because I'm looking for, for buyers you know, on, on your listing. What do you think stopped it from selling, Joe? Like we're in the hottest real estate market of all time. Why do you think it didn't go? I'm just so curious. And then they, I would just shut up. Mm -hmm. And then they would answer and then I'd go, they're mine. The minute they answered, they were mine. So if all of you are not calling expireds right now, which are coming back to the market, you need to, FISBO, same thing. So those calls every day generated new business for me. And so if I'm generating business every day, then I can go hire an assistant to service it. Because if you hire an assistant, you take money out of your pocket and give it to this person to service the exact same amount of business, but you're not growing the business, now we're depleting the business. So we need pillars that add revenue. And the okay. only revenue is blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. No, you're so welcome. I was wondering if you have a morning routine or like a night routine that you do daily. I used to. So I used to be, um, again, I'm a, I'm a, a, a IDW. So I can wonder and ponder a lot. The only way I can move my brain is to have systems and processes and discipline. I am not disciplined today. I get to the office at nine, I have a fun morning routine, it looks completely different than when I was in build mode. So remember, when we're in build mode, that's like, get out of my way, I have a plan, I have a vision, it's gonna take me 10 years of busting my ass to really get there, but I gotta do the work. So my morning routine was wake up at 5.30, Take, you know, I would uh, do some form of exercise for me. I hate exercise. I hate it. I hate waking up early, um, but I had to do it. And so the way I got myself to the office at 730 is my coach had a thousand dollar check. Every time I didn't check in at 730, she got to cash the check for a thousand dollars. So I think there were five or six times in a year where I would miss and I'd be like, damn it. But that made me hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the other thing is you have to put accountabilities in place where people are waiting on you. Like the accountability that I have that keeps me working is I have a team. I have to show up, I have to get to the office, but I'm there by nine because I have other people getting there at 8.30. So for you, it's like, what is going to get you in front of your phone the fastest? And then what pain happens if you don't do it? Because the problem that we have as real estate agents, all of you, if you had a boss, you'd all be rich. Seriously, you would, because when you were, uh, did everyone have a job before real estate, most of us? What did we have to do? Get to work on time, punch in, punch out. You couldn't take four hours for, you weren't doing your laundry, you were working. And then we get into real estate and we become entrepreneurs and then we don't work. Like that, truly, so I would do a time study. What do I do every day? What am I really doing? And then think of yourself as having a camera. If I had a camera on your shoulder and followed you around all week and watched the tape back, would I be excited to hire you as my real estate agent? Or would I be like, no way. 
So like that, like the, the morning routine has to be what you want to do, but you got to get into the office by a certain time, ready, dressed for the day in your $8 dress, ready to go and conquer the day. Being in your jammies all day, sitting at home, it's not motivating. You're saying to the universe, I'm not open for business. I just rolled out of bed. Seriously, right? So you want to like, if you're going to work from home, look like this. Like get up, put your makeup on. You are ready because if somebody says, I'm ready, like I used to race out, like out the door if I used to get an appointment and I wanted to be prepared. So I would say make it what you need, but definitely have someone holding you accountable to it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, you need a mic so we can record it for people when we when they watch the playback. Oh. <laughs> Hello, um, great presentation. Thank you. I'm a I'm probably one of the in the upper ten percent of age. I'm a commercial real estate broker and I've been doing it since '84, and I'm still learning. And um, I've been on my own for a long time, and I joined um, the PDF group of companies, which is Paul Frank and. Um, nice. And the one thing, one thing I have learned is that um, uh, I used to think there was no I in team, but there is an I in team. There and is. then um, there's definitely typically no E in team that's successful. That's ego. And mm -hmm. so I've had to let go of my ego. Um, but um, I feel like a, a lot of times you get these habits. You know, it's a long time to change. And uh, you really, I mean, I feel like I need to take like three-month vacation just to erase all the bad habits. But mm -hmm. this EXP organization is awesome. And um, it's, a, it's just opening my eyes to a whole new world of building a team. It's really exciting. Um, and the book I'm reading right now, I'm just finishing up, is Ed Milet's book, uh, mm -hmm. Power One More. So good. I highly recommend it. But it's one thing to read it, but it's another to actually do it. Yeah. So. I'm reading it, I'm going to read it again, and then I'm going to do it while I'm reading it again. So I'm excited. Thank you so much for uh, so this. Welcome. And just remember to put the ego, ego away and um, move forward. Thank I you. I love that. I love that. One of my, um, one of my mentors said, um, you know, like, because a lot of people are like, I read all these books, but we don't do much with them, right? Have you ever read a book and you've done nothing? We're like, oh, that was great information. It's like cotton candy. You're just eating it. It tastes so good. He said, take five books that really are impactful to you. Like one of mine is Think and Grow Rich. Um, read them five times in a year. Each one, read it five times. Now you're becoming masterful at the book. At, and then you can teach that. You can give that gift back. You know, for me, I'm geeking out on Working Genius right now. I went and paid $5,000 to become a facilitator. I just eat it up. I love it so much. But I'm, I'm listening to every... Oh, by the way, there is a podcast. You should listen to the podcast. Um, it's called the Working Genius Podcast. So, like, d dive deep into it because then you can teach it to others and just open their eyes. Like, some of you won't do anything with it. Some of you will. But for the ones that will, it'll change your world. And that's such a gift. So, so thanks for sharing that. No I in team. That's so right, except for Working Genius. I love it. Yes. Hey, Tina. Yes. Huge fan. Love what you do. Love what you – every time you come, you give great content. You mentioned earlier about social media. You yeah. said it's not duplicatable. Yeah. Um, I have heard so many great social media experts just say, oh, my God, my whole business uh, on, on social media. EXP, a broker, it doesn't matter what brokers yeah. you're with. Yeah. And I'm like, how the hell do you do that? I have, I, I've, I'm on social media. I'm active on it. Every time I go on there to post – I'm like, squirrel, 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 and an hour later, I still haven't done what I need to do. Yep. So it's, I know no of you can relate to that. So it's, it's such a, a love-hate relationship with it because it seems like, okay, I need to do it, and I get it, and I do get interaction. Mm -hmm. It just, it takes so much time. So the time versus reward effort is just not there. Yeah. So, which I think is why you say it's not duplicatable. So please mm -hmm. speak to that. And how do you manage not only your social media, but your videos? Do you have a shooting schedule? Do you have someone to edit? I love shooting and I love doing all that stuff. It's the, the post yeah. content editing and, and get it production ready that just frustrates the heck out of me. So it seems like I see the value, but again, the, the time invested to make it that way just seems like so daunting that it's just discouraging. Overwhelming, yeah. Extremely. Um, so a couple of things. I think... Um, it's not duplicatable in a sense where if you're watching like uh, a certain person and you're like, I'm going to do everything they do. 
it's not duplicatable in that sense because everyone is their own person. I have certain things that I say and do and I love to talk about and you'll see the passion come out when I'm talking about it. The one thing I think that we get, we make a mistake on is we're like, okay, I'm going to do social media. And then you sit on a chair and you put the camera in front of you and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about this. And you're so uncomfortable because you're, you're trying to present something that you've not ever presented to a camera. And so what I always share with people, if you go onto my Instagram, you'll see a lot of examples of this, is I have my iPhone propped up on my desk on an angle, and then I'm do a lot of us do Zooms all day, right? If you're doing a Zoom, let's say, with a client, which I think I would start doing more. We do a lot of Zooms prior to meeting people, especially now with all the changes, and we build that rapport. So I'm talking to a client, and I've got my camera, my video camera on, kind of side profile on my face. Now I'm doing an entire presentation with the record on. I take that recording, because now I've just got a lot of golden nuggets in there. I'm talking about our process, our systems. Let's say you're trying to recruit sellers and buyers, which is our job all day. Now I'm talking. I can take that content. I can put it into vid, a, I think it's vid.io. Um, what is it? Vid IQ, no, Vid IQ is a YouTube one. There's a Vid AO, I think it's called, where you kind of like upload the video and it shoots out like 12 different, you know, snippets. So I have a, 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 a not an ISA, a VA, and she's like $6 an hour in Brazil. And I send her all of the content in a Google Drive and she puts it through the system. She organizes it for me. And then I just go in there and edit things that I don't like and it's just ready to go. And then she posts it and can put it on, you know, socialcurator.com. Social Curator is one. I think it's like $45 a month. And that even creates the post for you, like the, the verbiage. And it's got an AI integration. So you can say, hey, I've got a video of me talking to a client and we're talking about my process. And I really hit on these points. Can you create like a really inspiring educational post for Instagram that is in a seventh grader can understand? And then it'll take what you just showed it and make a cool post. And then you can kind of change it around to make it sound more like you. Um, but yeah, everything goes to AI cuts and then a VA that does all that stuff. But I would say record yourself a lot because everything you do is content. If you're coaching your team, have a camera in your face. When you're up in front of the room, somebody on your team better be recording what you're talking about. Because if you're trying to recruit agents to your team, which leaders should be doing that, I need to show people what it's like to work for me before they work for me. I need to show people what it's like to be part of our mastermind group before they actually commit because they don't know what they're joining. So that's what I think social media is about is what are you about? And you've got to have an attitude of this is my stance. Like this is who I'm about. And no, and this is really hard for me because I'm amiable. I want everyone to like me. Uh, everyone's not going to like you. I mean, no matter how, how you are, there's someone in this room that's annoyed with me right now, like that doesn't like me. I'm serious. And I never thought that was possible. <laughs> Just kidding. But I mean, seriously, like you, you think everyone's your friend and everyone likes you. People are rude, obnoxious. They will just go against you to just go against you. So you got to kind of have thick skin to be on social media. Get over yourselves. Like truly get over it. Get over how you look, how you talk. I used to like obsess about every way that I looked and I'm like, I hate my hair that way. I hate that. And it's like, who cares? Like you're seeing me right now. I see you right now. You look exactly like that on camera. Keep doing it. Like you're not, you can't hide. So um, hopefully that answered your question. Do you have an editor for your videos or do you just allow AI and, and the I let the AI do it. And then I'm also the editor for my videos. So I will actually go in to Instagram. I'll, I'll have an idea because I come and I'll pull up a video and then I'll find the content again that hits the pain point that I want. You got to think like the audience is, is on Instagram or whatever with a pain point. They want to know how do you solve it. What content can you give me? What tool can you give me? And you want to make your content shareable. I did a post recently. It got 500,000 views on Instagram because it got like 6,000 likes and 5,000 shares. And it was about NAR. The hottest subjects are where you want to lead, right? Lead into whatever's going on. So you're looking at the news and then you're saying your opinion on it. It could, you, you've got to have no ego, like you said. You could be wrong in six months, but who cares? No one is going back to your video to go, she was so wrong about that. 
two million agents didn't leave the industry. It was only one million, dummy. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, no one's doing that. Right. So, like, you're just for the day, hey, I think with this NAR, I, I, I thought two million agents would leave the industry. I really do believe that because there's just, there's so many people that don't know their value and they're going to struggle in this environment. And you don't do anything different for YouTube. You just do, you just put it out there. YouTube and is long form. So when you guys are coaching and training, I have um, some of the worst YouTube videos ever. I would get an award for the worst. The worst uh, graininess because they're filmed on Zoom. So it was me at the front of the room teaching our mastermind about listings. And we got 200,000 views on a really poorly, poorly videoed uh, video. And so it's about the content. That just proves that people want good content. They want the nuggets. When you guys are doing your listing presentation, break it down. Put it online. Or, you know, if you're doing uh, videos for sellers, you know, think about I bought a house in Buford, South Carolina, and there was a lady there, and she would literally take her um, camera and put it on her dash, and she drove through every neighborhood in that whole town. She was my gal. I was riding in the car with her. I was looking at the listing on Zillow. I would go to her YouTube, and she'd go, this is Dota Island, and then she would guide me through the whole neighborhood. Think about it. Like, she was my realtor because I was having a parasocial relationship with her, shopping with her. She didn't even know she was shopping with me. So, like, how can you guys get into the mindset of the buyers and the sellers? Give them what they want. They don't need to, to move to Sacramento to see Sacramento. You guys should have that camera on your dash every freaking day. This is what it's like to drive around. Like, I didn't know how beautiful Sacramento was till I got here, but if I would have seen videos about it just driving down the road, that's going to get people to understand, like, oh, this is what it's like to live there. This is where the TJ Maxx is. This is where the, the cool outdoor mall is. Like, they just want to know. So get out of your own way about making them professional. My most professional videos tank, all of them. The crappy ones, because they're real. They're authentic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.